As we have seen before, John had no vocabulary with which to deal with 21st century weaponry, so he was shown his vision with images he could understand and communicate. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed, by the fire and the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. Revelation 9, 17-19 this passage does not require millions of horses with birth defects. It's symbolic, I hope, of an army that's swift, fierce, and deadly. They're well armed using three specific classes of weapons, symbolized by fire, smoke, and brimstone. If I had to guess, I'd say that represents nuclear, conventional, and biochemical warfare, things the Chinese have spent decades developing but have never used in open warfare. And the bit about the tails like serpents with heads on them? That's a tough one. Perhaps the key is the word serpent. The Greek ophis means snake. But as in English, the word can be used in the sense of a sly, cunning, malicious person. Indeed, this same word is used of Satan himself in Revelation 12.9 and elsewhere. So the passage seems to mean that while the Chinese hordes are fighting a public war in one theater with fire, smoke, and brimstone, they are also fighting a private, sneaky war in the rear, maybe on a different front or fought in a different way. For instance, undermining rival governments from within with political intrigues. At present, China is a sleeping giant, if ever there was one, but all it will take to wake them up is four demons from out of town. Once awake, the purpose of their aggression will be to severely depopulate their neighbors, providing room for China's population to expand, Liebensraum, as the Nazis would have called it. If China has any kind of national memory, they will be especially brutal toward Japan, who did precisely the same thing to them a century before. India, Australia, and Southeast Asia, the most populous regions to survive World War III, will also be hard hit. Taiwan is toast. Korea is unified and promptly swallowed whole. The Philippines are overrun, and this time there's no MacArthur melodramatically promising to return and save the day. Malaysia, Indonesia, and the rest of Southeastern Asia are gone. The Far Eastern Muslim populations, those who weren't obliterated as the Middle East perished under the folly of Gog, are wiped out. And as in the oh-so-recent war in the West, over one and a half billion lives, one-third of the Earth's remaining population, will be lost. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons, and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. Revelation 9, 20 and 21. Genocidal wars will seem so common by this time that the survivors in the West will greet the news of World War IV with yawns and shrugs. Gee, that's too bad, but what does it have to do with me? I've got problems of my own to deal with. One gets the feeling from these verses that the general populace doesn't make the connection between the disasters they're experiencing and the displeasure of God. If the bombs aren't falling in their own backyard, then life is good, relatively speaking. In a world without moral absolutes, World War II-style holy indignation against the evil aggressors will be a meaningless concept. But even if the West wanted to get involved, which they won't, there's not an enough infrastructure left to mount any kind of sustained military response. So for everybody east of the Euphrates who wasn't killed in the War of Magog, a new peril has risen. John saw them, heard their number, and saw their battle flags. The prophet Joel saw them as well. A people come, great and strong, 
the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. The next time an army even remotely this large marches, a thousand years will have passed, but that's a story for another chapter. The Battle of Armageddon, which we'll discuss in due time, is in reality merely the final engagement of World War IV. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. If an army two hundred million strong wants what you've got, they're going to take it, and there's not a lot you can do to stop them. Part of the strategy seems to be to consume or destroy whatever crops and infrastructure they find, kind of like Sherman's march to the sea only on steroids, leaving no way for their hapless victims to fight back or even survive. They don't want to subjugate people like the Muslims did. They simply want to kill them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over the mountain tops they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Joel, like John, sees them as a mighty state-of-the-art military machine. Leaping over mountains sounds like close air support to me. The noise he describes could be jet aircraft engines. Before them the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. No kidding, Joel. Anybody in their path who has a clue of what's about to happen to them will be scared spitless. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. This is the picture of a modern, well-trained, well-equipped army in superb physical condition, drilled, disciplined, and skilled in the tactics of both open field and urban warfare. As usual with huge armies, their very presence brings with it environmental disaster. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about this mighty army is that although they are led by demonic forces, and regardless of the fact that they have no relationship at all with Yahweh, they are still performing His will in His time for His purposes. They just don't know it. Yahweh gives voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. For the day of Yahweh is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Joel 2, 2 through 11. Joel wrote primarily to warn 9th century B.C. Judah that there was a Babylonian horde in their future if they didn't repent. Nebuchadnezzar's army would function in exactly the same way as the unwitting hand of God's wrath, albeit on a much smaller scale than this future Far Eastern military machine. So I would be remiss if I didn't include the admonition that accompanied the prophecy. Now therefore, says Yahweh, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rent your heart, and not your garments. Return to Yahweh your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he who relents from doing harm. Joel 2, 12 and 13. The call for repentance was not for Judah alone, but for every one of us in every age. There is one more interesting and important question. What's the Antichrist's position on the Eastern Holocaust? Two scenarios are possible. He could see China's move as a threat to his own power, perceiving that once their position is unassailable in the Far East, the Chinese will turn their acquisitive attentions toward him. Scripture, however, seems to support the opposite view. China's war of expansion is being done with the Antichrist's blessing, supervision, and support. 
Like 1930s Italy under Mussolini, behaving like a bully in his own backyard, while in reality being little more than a puppet of the far more powerful Third Reich, China will defer to the Antichrist in matters of their own regional interests. Remember... Authority was given to the Antichrist over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Revelation 13, 7 and 8. Nobody challenges the big dog. We will see this destructive horde again at the very end of the tribulation. He whistles, they come, everybody dies. Film at 11. Isn't the Antichrist concerned that the world under his control is dying off faster than butterflies in a blizzard? Apparently not. He works directly under the authority of the dragon, Satan. See Revelation 13, verse 2. And his agenda is to kill as many humans as he can before they turn in repentance to Yahweh, dooming the object of God's love to an eternity of separation from him. That's the devil's idea of winning. The sixth trumpet, then, takes us into the second great war of the tribulation, a war that's every bit as devastating, though somewhat more lopsided, as the first one. It will claim the same horrendous number of victims, but will be played out in a different theater. World War III starts in Israel and spreads east and north toward Siberia and westward through Europe and Africa to the Americas. World War IV spreads outward from China, consuming the most densely populated nations left on earth. It is a war that by itself would surely seem to qualify as the second woe that was pronounced upon the earth after the fourth trumpet, but it's only the beginning. We are told precisely when the second woe will be finished. Revelation 11.14 states, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. What is the context of this telltale verse? It comes at the very end of the discussion about the two witnesses, after their deaths, even after the things they did following their martyrdom. We'll cover this bizarre material a bit later. For now, I just want to acquaint you with the idea that the second woe is intimately associated with the activities of the two witnesses, and it stops when they do. As we shall see, everything within the bold judgments until the actual arrival of the Messiah fits perfectly within the description of their, quote, ministry, which we reviewed in a previous chapter, stopping the rain, turning lakes, rivers, and groundwater into blood, and generally striking the earth with all plagues as often as they desire, Revelation 11.6. As these plagues progress, the inhabitants of earth will begin to wonder how it will all end, how long the agony will continue. Although God's word clearly teaches that the end will come precisely 1,290 days after the Antichrist declares himself to be God, almost no one will be aware of this. Biblical knowledge, even for most believers, will be rudimentary at best during these dark days, and that's a pity for God has provided reason for hope in the structure of the judgments of the Revelation. As we have seen, the seals are administered by Christ himself. They recapitulate the entire scope of the tribulation. The trumpets are administered by seven angels. They, too, span its entire seven-year duration. The first four transpire in the first half, and the last three, the three woes, define the second half, known as the Great Tribulation. These woes are described in detail by the seven bowl judgments. Notice that both the trumpets and bowls are specifically said to wrap up the tribulation. <laughs> 